sheep. Okay. Praise God. It's a great time, so get involved. Luke chapter 17, if you have your Bibles. How many Bibles do we have in the house of the Lord today? Do we have any Bibles? Hold them up. If you brought a real Bible, a real. Oh, there's pretty good. You all are doing better than they were in Trenton. No, not that phone. That's a cheat. That's a cheat. I mean, I cheat sometimes too with the phone, but I'm talking about good old leather or imitation leather or paper Bibles. But if you don't have your Bible, go ahead and go on your phone to Luke chapter 17 verse number 28. We're going to see what the word of the Lord is going to speak to us here today. Luke 17, 28. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. You know, nothing in that sounds like there was anything wrong. It was just they were going on with life. They were living life. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed? In that day, he who was on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who was in the field, let him not turn back. Jesus says, remember Lot's wife member Lot's wife. I want to talk to you today for a few moments, hopefully um, stir your spirit a little bit, how the Lord is stirring mine, and read to you this message. There is a lot to learn from this season. There's a lot to learn from this season. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to speak to us. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your word that is true. I pray your word would now minister to our souls. I pray we could hear from heaven. Thank you for your presence that is in this house. But now, Lord, let your word speak to every family, every life, every mom, every dad, every person. Let us hear from heaven today. Help us, Lord, to understand the urgency of the hour in which we live. Let us leave here changed by the power of the word of God. Speak to us and show us your ways in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. In Guatemala, you've heard a lot of the stories here, and there have been great stories and great testimonies that you heard about some of the services and the things that we got to experience there. Uh, we were leaving um, from one church in Guatemala City, our church is there, and we were headed to the city of Antigua, and we had just left climbing a volcano. Well, uh, a few of us climbed the volcano, most of us rode horses up the volcano, but... A few, uh, two, uh, rode, uh, two actually climbed. The rest of us rode horses off the vol volcano. We'd gotten down, and, and we were driving to the city of Antigua. And as we were driving, our driver started to speak in Spanish, just say all kinds of stuff. And he's pointing to the side of the mountain that we are driving by. And he's pointing, and he's, he's talking to Carlos, our designated translator on the trip, Carlos and Damia, they were our designated, they're still in Guatemala, and, and he's talking and he's saying these things and he's pointing, and, and I don't really know what's going on, but Carlos turns to me and he says, and, and the driver actually pulls over and he points to this, this area here, and, and he said to Carlos, and then Carlos said to me, there used to be an amazing resort there, he said. He said it was an amazing golf club, the biggest and best golf club and the biggest and best resort in Guatemala. But he said, the volcano destroyed it all. We stopped, and he pulled off to the side, and he started talking again in Spanish. There, there was nothing really to see, just trees and kind of darkness behind the trees. And there was a valley where it was just kind of dark and black, and there wasn't really anything to, to look at. And he goes on, and he says to Carlos, who then translates it to me, that, that says, many homes, and that resort was completely destroyed. He said, you can walk through there, and... You can still see the destruction. You can still see, he said, many bodies are still in there and they're, they're under the ash and they're under the lava and they're under the destruction. And then Carlos repeated what the driver said in a somber tone. He turned to me and Carlos said, many people died there because they refused to leave when they were warned to leave. They refused to leave. When they were warned to leave. And though it's such an easy 
biblical metaphor for those who lost loved ones in the eruption of the Fuego volcano in 2018. It is more than just a sermon illustration. It's a painful moment of loss and devastation. I, I've got an article. I, I started to do some research on that volcano that, that, that erupted in 2018 and stumbled across one lady. Her name was uh, Euphema Garcia. I think I've got her picture there. Uh, she was a resident of the village of San Miguel, and Euphema lost her entire family in the eruption. She had gone to work that day, and she wasn't there, but her family was lost. She lost her husband, and listen, her nine children were lost in that eruption. And the article says, because they refused to leave. They are only a few of the estimated 2,900 people who died from the volcano's eruption. I searched online to try to find some explanations as to why the people died in that volcano. Surely, surely there was some, you know, and there was some. There, there's a lot of different uh, uh, articles about this because it's so, it just happened in 2018. So there's a lot of news reports and things you can look at and, 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 and reasons given for why people died in this, in this modern day when we kind of know when they're going to erupt and we kind of can sense what's going on in the atmosphere and people who have lived around the volcano their whole lives. I tried to find some reasoning why so many deaths would take place because of this volcano. And then there's some, there's some reasons. One, one is because um, some of the people um, didn't get the warnings on time. And you can kind of understand that in a little more less advanced culture than ours and a culture that doesn't have maybe all the communication and the tools that we do. And so I can get that. And, and another uh, excuse and, and a reason that people died is they said some people got the message, but they didn't get out fast enough. And the mud and the lava flow from that volcano was so fast that they just could not get out of its harm's way fast enough. And, and really, to be honest with you, I, I can come to grips with those answers. I, they're tragic. It doesn't take away from the tragedy of it, but I can, I can process that. Didn't get the warning in time or couldn't get out fast enough. But the other reasons are not as easy to accept. The other reasons that are explanations for why so many people died in that eruption. One of the reasons is Many people attempted to protect their property. Some people stayed behind to protect their homes and their belongings. Similar to how if you study the, the eruption of Pompeii years and years and years ago, you can go to the site of that devastating volcanic eruption in Italy and you can go there and there are still people that are encased in lava. And there's one place you can go and there's a person that is encased in lava holding on to her jewelry. That was one of the reasons. Another reason that is cited is a disbelief or an underestimation of the danger. They underestimated the severity of the situation or believed it would pass by quickly. Oh, it's tragic, it's unnecessary, but unfortunately, it's not unusual and it's not a new narrative. There is a similar disregard for warning in the story that we read in the, in the scriptures today, the story of Lot in the Old Testament. And we read when Jesus references that story in Luke. And Jesus said that the last day scenario, the last day environment, the last day, the way people would act, the culture, would be similar to how it was in the days of Lot. But the lesson that scripture wants you to learn is not the danger itself, and it's not the wicked characteristics of that city of Sodom, nor is it even the fiery destruction that came upon that city for their wickedness. The lesson, rather, is to be found in the life of Lot. As Jesus concludes the matter with the poignant statement, remember Lot's wife. There's a lot to learn from in the story. There's a lot to learn from in the story. Permit me to redeem the time today by simply paraphrasing the story. You can fact check me later by reading 
Genesis chapter 19 for yourself. Go there and fact check my recounting of the story of Lot here and, 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 and go check the details. You'll find they're there in Genesis chapter 19. Lot had made a life in the city of Sodom and, and he had chosen that because you know the story if you've been in church for a while, him and Abraham and their families and their herds and their, and their workers, they can't get along so they've decided to separate and Abraham being the good man he is says, Lot, you can choose. You choose which direction you want to take your people, I'll go the other way. And Lot chooses what the Bible calls the fertile, the prosperous lands of Sodom. Sodom was, was a place that wherever it was situated, it just seemed to be easy to grow crops and agriculture. And it was just a place where it was easy to prosper. And so Lot chose that, said, I'll take my family there. And in and, and Genesis 13, it says that Sodom was like the, the well-watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord. It just was fertile. It was conducive to agriculture and prosperity. But the Bible also tells us that Sodom was an extremely wicked city. The city was known for its extreme wickedness. In Genesis 13, 13, it says, Now the people of Sodom were wicked. They were great sinners against the Lord. It was also became regarded and well-known for its extreme sexual immorality. The inhabitants were associated with sexual depravity. Uh, particularly, the episode in Scripture that illustrates this is when the angels come to give Lot the information and to rescue Lot, that the men of the city come to Lot's door. The Bible says they're literally banging down the door to get to these men because they want to rape them and know them. There's this term that the Bible uses. There, there was an extreme um, immorality and sexual sin in the city. And they were going to they take these angels and have their way with them. Uh, Sodom was also known for its violence. It was a violent city. and It's inhospitality. It, it regularly mistreated foreigners and visitors. They were violent and inhospitable people shown by how they wanted to take advantage of Lot and his angelic guest. And Lot had built a life in that city. And when God sends the angels to rescue Lot from the destruction that will come upon the city, from the judgment of God, Lot literally, read the story, literally has to be dragged by the hand out of the city. The angels cannot motivate him to leave. He literally, the Bible says, they took him by the hand and dragged him out of the city to rescue him. The consequence of this lack of urgency in Lot's life, the consequence would not be that Lot would not be saved, he would be saved. But the tragedy is his family would not. His family would not. You say, doesn't his daughters get out? Yeah, but read into the story. The angel said, get your sons-in-laws, get your sons, get your daughters. There was family that was lost. He had sons-in-laws that, that didn't make it. He, most people believe Lot had sons that baby had grown up and, and weren't in his household, but they were lost in the city because the angel said, get your sons and let's get out of here. And of course, his wife, at the very edge of deliverance, almost free, turned to get one more look at the life they had built. The Bible says she was turned into a pillar of salt for looking back. All of this because Lot would not leave the city. And the question that I have is the same question I asked of those that did not survive the volcano. Why? Why? Lot, why not? City. Why? That's why. Lot stayed in Sodom until the very last moment possible. He stayed in that city until its destruction for a couple reasons that I see in the story that I want to bring to you today. The first reason that it seems that Lot could not be persuaded to leave is because Lot had prospered well in that city. He had a lot of prosperity there. We said he went there because of its prosperity. It was a city that, that was wealthy. It was a city that had potential to build a business. And despite knowing all of the city's 
wickedness. He took himself there and he took his family there because it was there that they could be financially blessed. It was there that they wouldn't have to worry about meals. It was there they wouldn't have to worry about the next paycheck. They went ahead and they tolerated the wickedness because they could be taken care of financially there. His decision was driven by material gain rather than spiritual considerations. You say, why do you bring that up, Pastor? I'll tell you why. Because over the years of serving in the kingdom of God and being in the church myself, I have seen far too many kids lost to the world. I've seen far too many marriages end in divorce. I've seen far too many people that I know and love who backslid and left serving the Lord because they were chasing prosperity. I've watched as people would leave a good church where their kids are established and move somewhere where there's no spirit-filled church they can attend because there was a good job that would pay them more there. I've watched kids be moved out of stable churches where they're thriving into areas without a spirit-filled church because you don't understand, I've got a great job opportunity there. My friends, I'm telling you, we are so blessed. Every person sitting in this room today, you may not realize it and you may not acknowledge it, but you are blessed beyond measure. You are blessed beyond you know. You're blessed beyond the level that you give thanks for. I'm telling you, we don't adequately give thanks to God for the way that he has blessed us. You heard about the churches in Guatemala. You heard about the church, the church on the mountain. They talked about it in Trenton too because there was just a mud floor. It wasn't a concrete floor. It wasn't, a, it wasn't even a dirt floor. It was packed down mud. And what Brother Harold said over there that moved him is there was a man or two that walked into that service before church even started and got on their knees in the mud to pray for God to move in that service. I'm telling you, we are blessed. If we don't have a washroom one Sunday, we are blessed. If we got a little dust, I'm just telling you, we have got to realize the blessing of the Lord in our lives, and you are rich. Oh, praise God. You are rich. (laughs) And I tell you that because there's a danger in prosperity. We have to survive the blessing of the Lord. (laughs) We have to survive blessing. Uh, There's a book, um, Thomas Brooks, it's a very a famous kind of classic Christian book. It's called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. You can probably, it's probably a public domain now. It's so old. You could download it. You could just put it in a PDF. It's an old famous book by Thomas Brooks, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. And in that book, he says this, listen to it. He says, adversity hath slain her thousands, but prosperity her ten thousands. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and said, charge them, this is 1 Timothy 6, 17, charge them that are rich in this world, that they not be high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly to all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works. In other words, don't trust in the riches. Use your life to do good things. Uh, Ready to distribute. Uh, Don't hoard it. Don't take it. Don't think you can rely on it. Don't think you can count on it. He said, be ready to redistribute it. Willing to communicate. Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Uh, I'm thankful that the Lord has blessed your life. But listen to me. Don't ever become confident in those blessings. Our hope, our trust, our foundation is in the Lord our God. That's where we can trust. That's where we are secure. That's why, listen to me, it's easy to get trusting in the riches and the things of this world. But that's why tithing is important. Because what does tithing do? It keeps God in priority even in the midst of my blessings. That's why giving is so important. You say, why do you t- 
take four weeks and give. Because you know what? It won't cost you a lot to pack a shoebox. Uh, the total cost might be $25. Uh, but do you know what it does? It keeps me generous. Uh, it keeps me thinking about others. Uh, it keeps me keeping my prosperity in proper place. There was somebody, I don't know if she's here, there's, there's somebody in this church that got a shoebox when they were a kid. Are they here? There was somebody they told me that in this church that came to Canada that got shoeboxes when they were a kid. It makes a difference when we give. Hallelujah. Anyhow, that's good preaching. Whether you clap or not, that's good preaching, somebody. I know I've been gone for a couple weeks, but don't get quiet on me now. That's why this is important, because prosperity is a killer. That's why giving is so important, because, listen, I don't want to be lost because of money. I'm going to tell you this. I'm blessed. We're blessed. We know we're blessed. We thank God every day for our blessings. But there is not one thing that my wife or I own that is worth my kids not making it to heaven. I'm telling you, listen to me. There aren't enough dollars in this world or enough commas in your bank account that can give you the peace that you need to sleep at night and the joy that will keep you going and keep you strong. There's not enough money in this world to give you what only God can give you. There's not enough riches to fill your heart. But Lot was chasing that prosperity. The second thing about Lot Read the story. This is not how it started. When it started, Lot dwelt outside for his family. He, he kept them, he talked about the weaknesses of Sodom, but over time, he moved his family into the city and raised his family in that wickedness of that city. Now, now, if you've been serving the Lord for a little while, maybe you've been serving the Lord for just a few years or a few months, you're not going to understand what I'm about to say, Okay. And just bear with me for a second. But if you've been serving the Lord for a long time, 50 years old, you know, 50 years serving the Lord, 60 years serving the Lord, 40 years serving, even 30 years serving the Lord. If you've come from the old church, if you've been in the church, I'm not talking about the Pentecost, I'm just talking about church. You've just been in church for a while. You know that there used to be a time we couldn't do nothing. It didn't matter what church. You just, there were some things that church people didn't do. There was just some, it didn't matter what church you went to, but there were just some things you didn't do. You know what? I remember when I was growing up, we were still kind of at the end of church people, church kids didn't play sports. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm just saying that's the way it was. I, can, I laugh with ministers who tell me that, that older ministers, that they weren't allowed to play golf. Help us, Lord. They would sneak and play golf, you know. They weren't allowed to play golf. They, Christians didn't go to movie theaters. If you don't believe it, Google it. Should Christians go to, there's still people out there saying, should Christians go to movie theaters? Still talking about that. Because that was something that was in kind of Christian culture. You just didn't do those things, you know? My wife tells you she got made fun of in the 80s for not having a television set in her home. And look how far we've come. Look at how much we struggle. We've come a long way, friends. Yeah, we have. We're struggling with such a lot. And I like sports. And I like golf. And I'm a Star Wars nerd. I'll tell you this. I don't want to lose my soul. I don't want to lose my soul. Because Jesus said, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And I'm telling you, here we are. And we're coming into, believe it or not, we're coming into 2025. Those people who said we couldn't do any of that, they didn't think we'd even be here by now. And I'm surprised we are too. But we're coming into 2025. And you say, why are you preaching like this, Pastor? Because we're going to get through Christmas. And before you know it, it's going to be a new year. And I'm going to tell you this. As you enter this new year, I want you to consider making the kingdom of God priority again. 
I want you to be thinking over the next few weeks as you're thinking of something happens as you enter a new year and you think, I got to get stuff right. I got to do it better. I got to make things better in my life. And I'm telling you, we've got to get back to faithfulness again to God and faithfulness to the house of God and faithfulness to the things of God. We've got to teach our children priorities and what matters again because the tragedy of the story of Lot is that Lot will get out, but his family will be lost. Lot will survive, but not his family. Can I, for every person here, listen to me. Surviving spiritually requires more than just coming to church on Sunday. I'm telling you, I can't survive on this. It's great, great worship today. Subpar preaching Great work, great offering, great testimonies, all these things. I can't survive on this. This is good. I need it. I need it in my life. But I'm going to tell you, Monday morning, there's a wicked world that's full of sin and full of wickedness and darkness and stuff that's going to come at me and stuff that's going to come at you. You can't survive on this. It's like eating one piece of bread on Sunday and not eating the rest of the week. You're going to be weak. You'll be, you'll be susceptible to sickness. I'm telling you, you need more than this. You need prayer every single day. You need to get up and talk to God every day. You need Bible in your life every day. That's why I'm trying to get us get into our Bibles. Uh, if you use your phone, set a reminder. You need to read your Bible today. You need the Word of God in your life. You need to know some scriptures. Uh, you need to memorize some scriptures. Uh, you need to understand the Word of God. You need to read the Word. Let me tell you what else. You need to talk about sin in your house. Uh, you need to talk about the consequences of sin. You need to make your home a place where the Spirit of the Lord dwells. Hello, somebody. Because Lot integrated his family into that world of that day. So much so that there was apparently even some compromise in Lot's life. Some moral compromise. Despite being distressed by Sodom's immorality, Lot's actions indicate he himself had been compromised as he hesitated to even leave warned by the angel. We see his compromise as those men of Sodom knock at the door, give us those men. Lot goes out and says, don't take them, but take my daughters. Have your way with them. We see something had happened a lot in that city. And there's a scripture that really confuses me a bit. It's in 2 Peter 2, 6. Throw, throw it on the screen. It's a confusing scripture that I have trouble with because in 2 Peter 2, 6, uh, it talks about, Peter's talking about this episode. In fact, this episode of Sodom is all throughout the Word of God. It's a, it's a marker. It's a foundation that keeps, the scriptures keep coming back to it. And, and in 2 Peter 2, 6, it says, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. I know we don't read that a lot in scripture. We don't, in church, we don't like to talk about that. But that's the Word of God. And verse 7, and delivered this is the part I struggle with. Righteous Lot. Delivered righteous Lot. Who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. It's a weird scripture because righteous Lot Peter's telling you that Lot saw the immorality and it bothered him. He was troubled by what he saw in that city. He was bothered by the acts and the sin that had overtaken that city. It troubled him. It tortured him, the Bible says, to see the way that city was headed. But it didn't torture him enough. It didn't bother him enough. Daughters were engaged to men from that city. These men did not know God. In fact, when Lot says, we got to get out of here because the Lord's about to rain fire on this city, they thought he was joking. What? What are you talking about? God, what? When Lot tried to tell them it was time to leave, his sons-in-laws just thought it was a big old joke. Lot, we've never heard you talk like this before. Something, listen. Something was lost in the next generation 
who grew up in the wickedness. Oh, praise God. Hear me. In Lot's family, something, something had been lost from what Abraham had taught Lot. Something had been lost in what they knew. Something There was something that was lost in that next generation of Lot's family who grew up in the wickedness. Oh, pastor, you're being dramatic. No, no, no. It's happening right before our eyes. It's happening right before us. We have amazing prayer meetings here on Saturday night. They, are, they, are, they sustain my soul, I tell you. We have the move of the Holy Ghost. Great prayer meetings here on Saturdays. But I'll tell you, there's not a lot of youth or kids here for prayer. There's just not. They're at home on iPads and on Instagram and Xbox, but I got to tell you something. iPads and Instagram and Snapchat and Xbox is not going to save your kids. But listen to me. But prayer might save them. Hello. We have great altar services at this church. And yet most of our teenagers can't pray for five minutes at the altar. We have great worship. But most of our kids can't focus in church without getting on the phone for more than a few seconds. Most of our children and teens don't even know the books of the Bible. Much less how to quote Psalm 23 when you're going through a difficult time. And here, listen to me. They're not the ones to blame. Hear me. They're not the ones to blame. No, 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 Lot. You brought your family into that city. Lot, you brought your daughters and your wife and your sons and you brought them into that city. Those ones that were lost were not the ones to blame. Lot, you brought them there. You invested in that city. You determined the priorities, Lot. Lot, you were supposed to teach them about Jehovah. Lot, you should have taught them faithfulness to God. Lot, you should have talked about the urgency. Lot, you should have talked about how God hates sin. Lot, you should have lived with some urgency in your spirit about God and the things of God. Lot, you should have taken serving Jehovah more seriously. Because you didn't, Lot, the epitaph is in Genesis 19, 16. When the angels, verse 15, when the morning dawned and the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, Lot can't even wrap his head around what's going on anymore. The men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters. The Lord be merciful to him. And they brought him out sent him outside the city. Do you see it? The mercy of God literally dragged them away from the wickedness. And verse 16, then Lot said to him, skip down to verse 16, please, no, my Lord, they don't even want to leave. Then verse 24, the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heavens. He overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the city and what grew on the ground. And just when you think it's over and you're free, just when you think he got out, but his wife looked back behind him. One more look at the life they had built. One more look at the land of prosperity. One more look at their home. He became a pillar of salt. There's a lot to learn from this season. There's a lot to learn from this season. Ultimately, Lot's story serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of prioritizing worldly success over spiritual integrity. Lot is going to make it out, but most of his family will be lost in the destruction. 
Say, Pastor, why now? Why today? Check, check. Why today? Why now? Because as we enter the Christmas season, every tree, every light, every home set ablaze with lighted up snowmen and reindeer and Santa Claus, every Christmas event, every Christmas song from away in the manger, to all I want for Christmas is you over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And then again on Boxing Day, over and over. Every song is a reminder that Jesus came to the world, that 2,000 years ago, our Savior came. Jesus came to the world, and yet only a few knew he had come. Only a few got to experience the coming of the Lord. And here we are, 2,000 years later, celebrating that he came. But let us not forget that only a handful got to experience his coming. He would grow up, and only a handful would experience the miracles. He would grow up, and he would die on a cross, and only a handful would be there at that cross to be with him. He would grow up and become a man and die on the cross, and he would rise again, and only a few, a handful, would be there to see that empty tomb. He would be ascended to heaven, and only a handful, about 120, maybe 500, were there to see him ascend to heaven. Only a handful of the world saw him knew him, experienced him. Christmas is a reminder. Jesus came, and yet the world missed him. But Christmas is another reminder. And I hope that every Christmas song and every Christmas service and every Christmas tree resonates this into your soul. Jesus is coming again. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about how he came. But I want to talk about he's coming again. Jesus is coming again. And as the world gets worse and worse, listen to me. Some are happy that Trump got elected. Some are not happy. doesn't matter. The world's really not going to get better. The world's going to get worse and worse. You say, why are you so negative? Because the Bible says that. That's the word of God. This world is going to get to a place where God cannot tolerate the sin and immorality and the, the, the ignoring of him and the throwing up their fists at him. This world's going to get to a place where our world can't where our God can't tolerate the world anymore. But I got good news for you. I'm not planning to be here. I plan to be with him because the Bible says that there's coming a day where the trumpet is going to sound, where the dead in Christ shall rise first. But the scripture says, but we who are alive and remain shall not prevent them which are asleep. But when that trumpet sounds, we're going to rise together. The Bible says, so shall we meet them in the clouds, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And the scripture says, comfort one another with these words. If your soul, listen, I'm telling you, I, I, I hope he comes tomorrow. <laughs> There's days I wake up and say, God, come today. I, no, I'm, I'm talking to somebody who's got a song in your heart that says this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Oh, the angels beckon me through heaven's open door because I can't feel at home in this world anymore. You need to get this into your spirit. This is not our home. We don't belong here. Jesus is coming again. And I got to tell you, when Paul says, be caught up together, I want that to be my family. I want that to be my church. I want that to be the people that I love. Lot, I can't lose my home. 
can't lose my family. You can't lose your home. You can't lose your family. You can't lose it. Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Let the Holy Ghost speak to you for just a moment. For those who are right with God, if your soul, if you're right with God today, the talking about the coming of the Lord, it's encouraging. That's why Paul said, comfort one another with these words. It's powerful. You love it. Oh, it gets you excited. Maybe it's today. Oh, Lord, I'm listening for the sound of a trumpet. You see that open sky and think maybe today is the day and you're excited for it. But if you're here and you don't feel excited when you hear preaching of the coming of the Lord, that's your soul saying something's not right. I'm not saying your life is wrong. I'm just saying that maybe... Your family's not right. Your family's not ready. Your home's not prepared. Maybe it is your own soul that's not right. Maybe. I don't know, but I know this. Jesus is coming again. In fact, this entire Bible that I ask you to hold up every week, all of that New Testament... Is about telling the church, be ready, Jesus is coming again. Stay on target, Jesus is coming again. Don't fall back into sin, Jesus is coming. It's all, read it, read the New Testament. It's all about the writers of Scripture telling you, stay on course, Jesus, and then describing what it's going to be like. Stay on, stay on target, Jesus is coming again. Don't, don't, don't fall back, Jesus is coming again. That's what this word is about. My friend, that's what your life needs to be. Jesus is coming again, and I want to be ready. So what do I do? I'll tell you. Here's what you do. Here's what you do. The secret to survival of what will come on this world and being ready for the coming of the Lord, the secret is this, surrender. It is surrender. It is surrender. Even the Apostle Paul said, I die daily. Why? Because as a human, he still had to face the world. He had to face the darkness of the world. He had to face the temptation of the flesh. He had to fight back against the pride of life. He had to push back against all the darkness of the world. And so every day, the great apostle Paul said, I've got to re-surrender my life to God again. I'm going to tell him again I'm going to live for you. I'm going to commit my life to him again. I'm going to give everything to him again. It's surrendering of your finances. Lord, I give it to you again. It's surrendering of your time. Lord, I give it to you again. Life is a constant surrendering of your life to the plan and the will of God for your life. So in just a moment, as we begin to sing and we begin to worship for a few more minutes, I want to invite you to this altar. Come and surrender your life again to the plan of God. Maybe you've gotten off course. Maybe your life is more invested in sports than it is the kingdom. Maybe your life is more invested in Facebook and Instagram than it is the things of God. Maybe you know all kinds of stuff going on and you don't know one scripture memorized. I'm just telling you, today is a day of surrender. It may be some fathers who are going to come surrender for their family. It may be some mothers who are going to surrender the focus of their life to the kingdom again. It may be some soul who realizes you've gotten off track. It's not that you're lost. You're just off track. You're ingrained in the world. You've become uh, your life totally immersed in the world and you've lost the connection to the things of God. It takes a moment just to come and surrender again and say, Lord, I give Give you my life again if you will today repent of your sins the bible says that our god if we confess our sins is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness what you need to do today is what you did the first time surrender your life to jesus oh praise god let me pray for you lord I thank you, Lord, for your word that is true. I thank you, Lord, that you came. I thank you, Lord, 
that you came. I thank you, Lord, that you came and you gave your life for us. Uh, you gave your life a ransom for many. I thank you, God, that you gave your life for me. I thank you, God, for your blood that was shed at Calvary. I thank you for the blood that washes white as snow. I thank you, Lord, for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. Uh, I thank you for the, the way, Lord, you continue to reach uh, for those you love. Uh, I'm thankful that your mercy grabs us by the hand and brings us to the place of safety. I thank you, Lord, that you're a faithful and a good God. And I pray today that we could have our eyes opened to the urgency of the hour, Lord God. I pray we could find that peace that passes understanding in your sight. And I pray that we could surrender all to you today. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face there to sing forever of his saving grace oh lord help us to be aware of the hour that we live in jesus name i want to invite you to pray i want to invite you to this altar let's sing let's seek the lord